Iodine was among the first of the elements discovered during the wars of Napoleon. Now, it's interesting is, is that we discovered how to can food. And it took us another 100 years before the can opener was invented. <laughs> the use of iodine for treatment of goiter was the first time that a single item, iodine, was used to treat a specific illness, goiter. In today's world, many doctors think that iodine is a cause of goiter. We discovered iodine to treat goiter, not to induce goiter. Now, you'll notice the different types of halogens. You have fluoride, uh, chlorine. Look at the dates that they were discovered. Look at bromide, uh, discovered back in 1826. Iodine in 19, uh, 1811. Astatine uh, back in a... At, in 1940, and this was because of the nuclear uh, age uh, that they discovered this one. This is a radioactive halogen. Now, iodine deficiency causes goiter. Now, there's two types of goiter. There is goiter with the thyroid hypertrophies, goiters where the TSH stimulates the uh, thyroid cells to get bigger. That's a TSH-driven system. Whereas in goiter secondary to iodine deficiency, there is hyperplasia. This explains why people with goiter have a higher incidence of what? Certain types of cancer, okay? Now, iodine deficiency worldwide is the number one reason for mental retardation. And if you have iodine deficiency, it can cause problems, and it's throughout the childhood years, you can get what's called cretinism, and you notice that short, short tissues, uh, pro mental retardation, there's problem, these people have IQs in their 50s, and we see a lot of these people in Bolivia up in the Andes Mountains right now where the Bolivian government is not putting any iodine in their salt. And because of this, then you see this type of thing. Uh, missionaries that come back from Bolivia tell me about quote, the little people. And these are small people, this big. They're usually about four foot tall with IQs of about 55. Now, people with goiter have a higher incidence of thyroid cancer, breast cancer, stomach cancer, esophageal cancer, ovarian cancer, and endometrial cancer. In the 1990s, Goiter was prevalent in large numbers in the Great Lakes region. 40% of school-aged children had goiter by 1924. In Akron, Ohio, 56% of the population had a goiter. With a ratio of six women to one man, the United States quickly added iodine to the salt after these studies were done. Why is there more women with thyroid disease and goiter than there is males? What's the reason? It's estrogen. Estrogen inhibits the absorption of iodine. Okay? Which explains what's the ratio of hypothyroidism in women as compared to men. It's nine women to every one male in the United States. And that's because of the estrogens women are, uh, have. <clears throat> that are inhibiting them <coughs> from absorb, absorbing the iodine. Every cell in the body contains and utilizes iodine. White blood cells cannot effectively guard against infection without adequate amounts of iodine. It's concentrated in the glandular systems of the body. Contains the, the thyroid contains the uh, largest amount of iodine. What's the number two tissue for making thyroid hormone in the body outside the thyroid? Huh? Nope. What tissue has the ability to concentrate iodine and use it to make thyroid hormone outside the thyroid? Nope. Ovaries. The ovary has the ability to concentrate iodine and to make thyroid hormone from, those, from that gland. So if you see a patient with hyperthyroidism, 
you are obligated to do a radioactive study on them and check the ovaries because they may have a hot thyroid nodule inside the ovary causing the th hyperthyroidism. Now it's interesting that the ovaries make a thyroid hormone called thyroid T2. T2 is, uh, can be used by the body to make T3 or T4. And of it, it's interesting that so many women start gaining weight when their ovaries are starting to fail. And when they're starting to fail, it's because of the decrease in T2 production. Guess what? You can buy T2 over the counter, non-prescription. And one of the vendors over here has T2 and some of their formulas that you can get, and you don't have to be on, you know, get it by prescription. There are other tissues that absorb large amounts of iodine, the breast tissue, the salivary glands. What happens to the salivary glands if you don't have enough iodine? You can't make saliva. So your eyes go dry, your, your uh, mouth goes dry, lack of iodine. Pancreas, uh, cerebrospinal fluid, the brain tissue, the stomach, the skin, lack of more glands, lack of iodine to the skin, what do you get? Dry skin, skin that can't sweat. So this, you get out there and you work in the garden and it's a hot day, you should sweat all over the body. But I've got patients who just get red and hot but they don't sweat. Decreased sweating is due to lack of iodine. And when you start these people on iodine, within three or four weeks, they start sweating pretty, uh, pretty good. Uh, iodine inside the cerebrospinal fluid. What does iodine do to the brain? Makes the brain more mentally alert, which is why you never, never, never give iodine to somebody just before they go to sleep because you'll wake up the brain and the brain will become very active. Iodine during pregnancy. A baby, a fetus inside the uterus and you give the mother iodine. Usually uh, we give iodine, enough iodine, as if the mother were a Japanese woman. How much iodine does a Japanese woman eat on a daily basis? 13.8 milligrams of iodine per day in Japan. You give that much iodine to a pregnant woman and iodine to the baby is like caffeine to us. Caffeine makes you very mentally alert, gives you tachycardia, gives you all sorts of problems. But newborn, you know, fetuses inside the uterus, you give them 12.5 milligrams of iodine a day the baby is very hyperactive, it's moving around. It's as if the mother just took 10 cups of coffee. You don't take iodine that day, the baby is nice and quiet and it doesn't move very much. But you give the mother iodine and the baby just starts stirring around a lot. It's as if the baby becomes very mentally alert while it's inside the uterus. It's very interesting, but iodine to the brain is very stimulating to the tissue. Now, we've learned about the sodium iodide symporter. The symporter is how you pump iodine into the tissues. Again, there are two types of iodine. What are they? There's iodine and there's iodide. What's the difference between the two? What's iodide? It's the salt of iodine. Now, iodine, will literally diffuse into a cell. So it diffuses in, whereas iodide needs to be transported in. So this is the transport mechanism. It's called the sodium iodide symporter. It's a transport mechanism. You will find babies that are born hypothyroid. And hypothyroid babies usually have a symporter defect. And many of you who, well, many women will develop breast cancer. And breast cancer is seen in a defective sodium iodide symporter. We can do testing for the symporter and we can check and see if it's okay or not. And we do have ways to fix these symporters now. 
of interest is, is that the SIM porter uh, is fixable. And it's even in children with hypothyroidism, you can turn them euthyroid by fixing the SIM porter, giving them iodine, and their thyroid starts making thyroid hormone. The stomach has the ability to have this importer. The mammary glands and the salivary glands have this importer present. It's because of this that we are able to do testing for the importer to see if it's functional. But as you can see, you can see the areas where the importer is functioning and working. These are other tissues where the importer is present. Notice the ovaries. And again, the ovaries can make their own thyroid hormone. They can't store it, but they can make it. The other tissue that has the ability to make thyroid hormone is the white blood cells of the bone marrow. Now you know of three different tissues that can make thyroid hormone. The thyroid gland, the ovary, and the white blood cells of the immune system. The thymus absorbs huge, uh, large amounts of iodine. The epidermis, uh, your skin, the choroid plexus of the brain. Uh, this is how the brain absorbs its iodine, is through the sodium iodide symporter. The symporter works against a gradient so that if you were to measure the amount of iodine in the serum in the blood, you would find the level to be one, but the, the amount of uh, iodine in the saliva would be something like anywhere from 28 up to 72. So the symporter is able to push iodine from a low concentration into a very high concentration on the other side. And that's because it works against a gradient. Again, notice here you got iodine versus iodide. Notice certain tissues have only the ability to absorb one or the other. So the thyroid only absorbs iodide, whereas the breast can absorb both iodine and iodide. The salivary glands can only take the iodide, whereas the prostate only the iodine, stomach iodine, skin iodide. That's why you cannot take any preparation that is just one or the other. Does that make sense? You've got to have both, both of these in order to do iodine supplementation. Iodine in children, it's essential for normal growth and development. It is crucial for normal central nervous system development and IQ in the first three years of existence, which basically says from the time a mother is, you know, knows that she's pregnant, you start giving her 12.5 milligrams of iodine a day. Why wouldn't you give her 25, 50, or even 100 milligrams? Because all of you know that there could be a potential problem with a pregnancy, period. And we know that in Japan, the average intake is 13.8 milligrams. So you can't go bad in court if something happens to that pregnancy. They can't blame you for giving that mother iodine throughout the pregnancy and the baby comes out with one arm or one leg. And then they try to blame it on the high doses of iodine. You sit there and say, you know, in Japan, they take 13.8 milligram. I gave this mother 12.5. What's the problem? Okay? A few, you know, millions of people in Korea and in Japan taking iodine. This can't be the source of this one-legged child. Okay? So, you know, you try to protect yourself. But also the fact is, is that when you give iodine to a mother that's pregnant, the baby will come out with an IQ that's about 20 to 30 points higher than the parents. I have two patients, actually two doctors, uh, a husband and wife, who both had four children. And the wife was pregnant with child number five. And I said, you need to take some iodine throughout this pregnancy. It's going to increase the IQ of the baby. And she sat there and said, look, I've got four brilliant children already. And I said, you don't know the definition of brilliant until you've seen a child who's been born with iodine. So she took the iodine throughout the pregnancy. 
saw me at a uh, conference last year on autism. And she was there, and she came up to me, and she says, I want to apologize to you. She said, uh, the baby is now one year old. And she said, I've got four others to compare it to. But she said, my fifth baby is definitely far superior IQ-wise than my other four. She said, this kid is like a living sponge, and it is doing things that none of my other children did at age one already. I've got 10 of these children in my practice. They're all running ahead of schedule mentally. I got a t one in the second grade who is doing fifth grade material. Her little brother at age four was going into preschool. And the mother was all in consternation. I haven't taught him his ABCs, and I haven't taught him his numbers. And I sat there and said, don't worry about it. This kid's, this kid's an iodine baby. He'll learn it faster than lightning. So the school teacher sits there and says, look, we'll teach him his ABCs and his alphabet, and he'll have it done by the end of the year. You know. And a month later, the kid is reciting all of his ABCs. He can write all out all of uh, his alphabet. He knows all of his numbers, and he's already starting to do mathematics. He's doing addition. And the teacher comes to the mother and says, I thought uh, I was going to do the teaching. And the mother said, you're supposed to, because I haven't done it. And the mother says, I haven't taught him. And the teacher says, well, neither have I, but he's picked it up somewhere. So a few weeks later, mother is listening to the daughter who's in the seventh grade playing with the little boy who's, in the, you know, four, who's four years old. And the mother hears the following comment, Johnny, come on over here and I'll, let's play school and I'll teach you everything I learned so that you don't have to go through the hassles of what I've had to go through. <laughs> so she... The little seven-year-old was teaching her four-year-old brother the alphabet. She was teaching him how to read. She was teaching him his mathematics. She was teaching him addition, and he's only four. These kids, I tell you, they are the most phenomenal children you will ever meet in your life. And, you know, this is something that really, really, really needs to be paid attention to. But it's 12.5 milligram tablet per day or liquid in the form of Lugol solution. Deficiency can result in cretinism, which is mental retardation and deafness, delayed physical and intellectual development. This actually teaches us something about bone development and skeletal development because iodine is crucial for the skeleton to develop appropriately. Look at this last statement. Mild deficiency in early fetal life will manifest as attention deficit disorder. Attention deficit disorder, you know, we used to put iodine in the bread. We used to put iodine in the milk. We put iodine in the salt. We took the iodine out of the bread. We took the iodine out of the salt. I'm sorry, out of the milk. And now, what's the U.S. Public Service doing? They're telling us that we need to decrease the total amount of salt in the population by one half. When you do that, all these women that are pregnant, what do you think is going to happen to them? They're going to start spitting out babies that have more ADD. From the year 2000 through 2006, the rate of ADD in the United States climbed 500%. What do you think it's going to do in the next 10 or 15 years as we decrease the salt intake in the population? And all these women that develop hypertension of pregnancy, what do the doctors tell them to do? You need to come off your salt. Well, you take them off salt, what have you just done? You've deprived a baby of a, you know, some iodine. And the problem is the doctor doesn't say, oh, and by the way, while you, we got you off your salt, we need to supplement you with iodine. You don't hear that statement. That's why this is becoming a public health disaster. In Haines, studies uh, back from 1971 through 74, we had an intake of urine of iodine, which was 320 microgram a day. This was during the days when we were, quote, iodizing the uh, bread and iodizing the milk. 
in Haynes 3, 1998, 1994, we had de taken the salt out of, I mean, taken the iodine out of the bread and the milk. We're down to the salt. Look what the intake is. It's 145. In Haynes, uh, 2001, 2002, salt, uh, the iodine intake in the spot urine is 168. The spot urine is the first morning urine and it kind of gives you an idea about how much iodine a person is eating over the last 24 hours. In my laboratory, we did a spot test, and we looked at uh, female values, and we found that the mean was 175 micrograms. And nationwide, we are seeing that the rate of iodine in the population is starting to climb back up. That's because we've raised the alarm to the fact that something has gone wrong and we need to pay attention. What's interesting is 16.5% of men had extremely low levels of iodine. So, and these, these are very low iodine. Iodine should be 150, uh, should be 0.151 to 200, uh, 200 or greater. This is where the vast majority should be, but look at this, 16% of our males are high po, you know, have very low levels of iodine. Among our teen, you know, women, 17.6% are extremely low in iodine in the population. Our numbers at the lab pretty much look like the numbers coming out of the national studies. From 1971 through 2000, NHAN showed iodine levels decline 50% in the United States. During the same time period, there was an increase in thyroid illnesses, cancer of the breast, prostate, endometrium, and ovaries. And what did I say? Lack of iodine, you go into a higher level of cancer, right? People with goiter have a higher rate of cancer. And what type of cancers were they? Cancers of the thyroid, cancers of the breast, cancers of the endometrium, and the ovaries. Look at the other cancers starting to show up. Iodine binds to its receptors throughout the body. If there is sufficient iodine present, iodine will be excreted. So if the body has plenty of iodine, then you'll urinate it back out. If the body is, ex is deficient of iodine, you'll start hanging on to it. And that's what the iodine loading test that we do tells you about, is the fact that it tells you if the body is starving for iodine. We felt that iodine uh, sufficiency is present when there's greater than 90% of the iodine is excreted. That is, you give somebody 50 milligrams of iodine and they excrete back out 45 milligrams of the total 50. But we do two studies. We do a spot test and a loading test. If the spot test says, here is somebody who is barely taking any iodine, I mean, very little iodine, and yet the loading test says this person's 90% saturated. What I have just said to you is an oxymoron. And what is that? Two opposing statements in the same sentence. How in the world can you barely be eating iodine and yet the body have almost a 90% excretion? because the body is, quote, saturated. And the reason is a defective sodium iodide symporter. That's why when we do testing, we check for both the spot test and the loading test, not just one. Because the two will give you a clinical clue about if the symporter is malfunctioning. Remember, it's the absence of iodine in a cell that will produce cancer in the body. And if you can't pump iodine into the cell, then you've got a problem with a potential risk for development of cancer. 98% of our patients had significantly low iodine levels, and that was based upon 2,500 patients in a nationwide pool that we did. There is one interesting thing here, and this is something that happens. Uh, we have this group down here that are very low in iodine intake, but then we have some people out of that uh, total number, some people were excreting more than 50% of the iodine. That is, you gave them 50 milligrams of iodine, 
and they urinated back out 52, 55, 60 milligrams of iodine. What happened? It's called a defective sodium iodide symporter. We put the iodine in, and we got more back out than what we put in, saying that the cells had trouble hanging on to the iodine. This is an interesting study because Back during World War I, a lot of people tried to get into the military, and many of them were rejected. Back in 1920, uh, 1966, the U.S. Agriculture Department started, went back and looked at the soil samples of all the men that were rejected during World War I from getting into the military because of goiter. And what they found was is that there was plenty of iodine uh, in the southern states, but remember, the Great Lakes region is a goiter region. So there was a lot of problems with goiters up here because there's no iodine up here. But look at what happened here. What do you see? Lack of iodine right across the northern United States and down along the coastline. Okay? So basically, there's problems in this area with too much water, and the water is washing all the iodine out of the soil. Does that make sense? So if there's not enough iodine, what's, what comes up right behind that low iodine? Hypothyroidism, and what's the other thing? Breast cancer. And I can't tell you how many people that I have found at this conference who have goiters. I have probably found that, you know, for those people coming around up there where the vendors are, I have found at least uh, probably 20 of you that have goiters. Now, let me make another statement. Among vegetarians, the ve vegan group, 80% of vegans are iodine deficient. What's the problem with us? I'm a vegetarian, too. We were taught that we should eat a more plant-based diet. But folks, we forgot to teach you how to eat marine plants. You know how to eat the land plants, but we forgot to teach you how to eat seafood, I mean uh, seaweed. So you need to learn how to start sticking seaweed in your, in your vegetable soups, how to stick seaweed in your uh, 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 rice and how to eat more seaweed on a daily basis, not just every now and then, okay? You, you know, in Japan, they eat seaweed three times a day. They put their seaweed in their gummy bears. They put seaweed in their soda crackers. They put seaweed in everything. And instead of using salt, they use seaweed to salt their food and so on and so on, okay? The thyroid needs six milligrams of iodine a day just to take care of itself. The breast, at least 35 milligrams. Larger women with larger breasts have bigger increases for need for iodine. Men with smaller breasts don't need as much iodine. Other tissues need iodine. Look, let me give you this here. This is uh, very interesting. The total human body can hold 1,500 milligrams of iodine. The thyroid at its maximum can hold 50 milligrams of iodine. Okay, did you hear me? 1,500 for the whole body. 20%, 20 percent, 20 percent of that 1,500 milligrams sits inside the human skin. If the skin is extremely depleted of iodine, you won't sweat. 32% of all the iodine sits inside the muscle. What disease do you think you're going to get if the muscle doesn't have enough iodine? Look, let's go through it here. Lack of iodine to the thyroid, what do you get? Enlargement, cyst, nodules, Scar tissue, decreased function. Lack of iodine to the breast, what do you get? Cyst, nodules, scar tissue, enlargement, lack of function. You can't enjoy them as much as you used to. Lack of iodine to the ovaries, you get cyst, 
nodules, scar tissue, enlargement, pain, like in the breast, and we get, what's it called? PCOS, polycystic ovaries. Women with recurrent cyst of the ovaries. Lack of iodine to the skin, what do you get? Decreased function. Skin that can't sweat. Decreased iodine to the skin, I mean to the muscles, 32% of all the iodine sits in the muscle. What do you get? Cyst, nodule, scar tissue, enlargement, pain. But knock out the word cyst and you got the nodules, the pain, the fibrosis, and so on and so on. What disease is that? Fibromyalgia. And women who have fibrocystic breast disease have repeatedly told me that when they take iodine, to get rid of the fibrocystic breast pain, guess what? The muscle pain disappears also. Does that make sense? So if you give iodine, we found, in fact, we did a uh, study with a Mormon group down here in Mesa, Cal uh, uh, Arizona, and uh, it was 100 Mormon women who had fibromyalgia and we gave them iodine to treat their, quote, fibromyalgia. And of that group, some, uh, out of 100 women, almost 80% of them had a decrease in the muscle pain just by putting them on iodine. Okay? We think we have broken the paradigm as to a source of fibromyalgia pain. It's not the source, because you can take a spinal cord and compress it from a Chiari malformation or a problem with a compression of the spinal cord like a herniated disc, and you can produce fibromyalgia muscle pain. Fibromyalgia is basically a trash can diagnosis. Just like headache, I've got a headache. That's a trash can diagnosis because it's a better statement to say, I've got a headache because I've got a brain tumor. I've got a headache because I've got meningitis. I've got a headache because my wife just hit me on the head. Fibromyalgia just means muscles that are hurting. You've got to go beyond that point and say, why are they hurting? And one of the first places to go to is iodine deficiency. If they're deficient in iodine, give them some iodine with some ATP cofactor, which contains vitamin B2 and B3, get the tissues to absorb the iodine and hang on to the iodine, and you'll see the, a lot of the pain go right down very quickly. As you can see, males need more iodine. Females need about the same, but as you get into pregnancy and lactation, the intake of iodine needs to be higher. The RDA was, helped, was set up to prevent goiter there was no real concern about the rest of the body's needs for iodine. And the RDA for iodine is inadequate for all, not, because it only is looking at the thyroid, but not the rest of the body. How much iodine does the thyroid hold? 50 milligrams. How much does the body hold? 1,500 milligrams. The RDA will not even come close to this. Does, you know, the RDA does not address the increased exposure to goitrogens that are in the environment, such as bromide. Where do you get bromide in the American dietary? We took the iodine out of the bread, and what do you think we put back in there? Bromide. We're putting bromide into our soft drinks. If you haven't looked up the word bromism, look it up. It's in the dictionary. Many of our children are suffering from bromism. And if you, uh, you know, where I live, from Nashville over to Asheville, the average 9 to 15 year old boy drinks five Mountain Dews a day. And one of the essential ingredients for Mountain Dew is brominated vegetable oil. And if you look up bromism, one of the problems with too much bromide in the brain is schizoid behavior. And you wonder, 
why kids are going to school behaving paranoid and they're going around killing each other and their, and their teachers. And if you go into the commons area of the high school, look at their, look at their uh, vending machines. In my son's school, there was 15 vending machines. 14 of those vending machines sold only Mountain Dew and only one sold water, milk, Coca-Cola or something else. And they were filling those vending machines three times a day because the kids were drinking so much of it. That's how bad the situation is out there. And also, we've been putting bromide in the bread instead of iodine. And then the bread is becoming loaded with bromide. Iodine is crucial towards keeping the breast from developing scar tissue. And as a result, uh, if you, if you uh, give iodine, you don't give it for the first three or four months until they get saturation. You give it for the first three or four years to get rid of 50 to 90% of the scar tissue in the breast is what iodine has the potential to do. During the lactation, the breast is more capable of capturing iodine via the sodium iodide symporter. And if the symporter is sick, then you can't get as much iodine into the breast, uh, especially for the milk. Now, in breast cancer, we have found that the patients have uh, lower iodine, and low iodine intake leads to a hyperestrogenic state. Hypothyroidism is associated with up to 80 to 90 percent est free estrogen levels against a norm of 40 to 60. Hyperthyroidism is associated with 20 percent free estrogen states. Basically, there is interaction between the estrogens and the level of iodine in the human body, which is why we know that estrogen inhibits the ability of thyroid to absorb. Now, this is what happens when you give iodine to cells, and you, like this is a oat cell carcinoma, oat cell carcinoma that has had the ability of the cells to enha enhance to absorb iodine. Look at what happens over a 10-day time period if you can get the cells to absorb iodine. That versus that in 10 days. Iodine induces apoptosis, and iodine will take away cancer. Iodine, let me finish off with this statement. Iodine induces apoptosis. Iodine takes away the immortality of cancer cells. And it goes to these cancer cells, and it says, it's time to die. Go out there and do it, because it's your turn. But cancer cells think of themselves as being immortal, and iodine takes away that immortality. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes, you talk about the uh, defective symporter. How do you fix that if that's the issue? Uh, we have published that. If you'll go to our website called helpmythyroid.com, if you go to that website, we have a whole group of uh, iodine research articles that have now been written. And there's three articles in there that will have the term vitamin C. That number two article will have the term fibromyalgia. And number three will have the, sodi the term sodium iodide symporter. Those three articles will tell you about how we can repair the uh, symporter. One of them is the use of ester vitamin C, about 3,000 milligrams a day. One of them is the use of high doses of iodine that you'll see in the paper on fibromyalgia. And uh, the other one is the use of vitamin B2 and B3 to help uh, repair the symporter. So there's different ways to repair these symporters. It's not just one way. There's multiple ways, but they can be repaired, and we can document. We are now at a point where we can document that repair having occurred. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, thank you. That was excellent. Uh, is this on? I, I, yeah. yeah. Um, could you just expand a bit on the evidence for iodine with fibromyalgia? And then number two, just exp I, I maybe quickly explain your, your treatment paradigm for fibro, uh, where, where you put that in, how do you 
How do you? Can in other you words, talk I'm, to me afterwards because it would take another hour. Okay. It was basically, you know, it's the type of thing in medical care, you listen to your patients. A lot of times people will give you the answer to a medical solution. Yeah, I agree. It's just listening to their weird, you know, problems. In this particular case, I was giving iodine for fibrocystic breast pain. And this woman came up to me and she said, you know, the iodine took away my breast pain, but it also took away all my muscle pain. Okay? I said, what muscle pain? I didn't know there was muscle pain. She said, yeah, you know, this, this stuff right here. Well, I touched all the tender points for fibromyalgia, and she said, yeah, every one of those has disappeared ever since I started taking the iodine. So we did some more studies, we got some more people, and sure enough, that worked. At which point, we took it to this large group of uh, Mormon ladies down here in Mesa, and 80% of them got better almost within a month. And I'm going like, this is not rocket science, guys. You know, we went back and looked at it, and sure enough, 80%, I'm sorry, 32% of the uh, iodine uptake in the human body is through the muscles. And that's when we started paying attention more to what tissues have what amount of iodine, what are the symptoms that a iodine deficiency in that tissue would manifest. Do you, do you think, is it the same for men, or have you, have you seen that? Or? We have seen the same for men. However, the other thing is, remember, a spinal cord compression. If you compress the spinal cord from a herniated disc, a spinal stenosis, a Chiari malformation, patients with, uh, with fibromyalgia will complain about a daily headache. Mm -hmm. Folks, is it normal for people to have headaches every day? No. If they have a daily headache, it's because there's a problem with the anatomy. It's an anatomical problem. Daily headaches, daily migraine headaches, that's an anatomy problem that needs to be repaired by a neurosurgeon, not by some other type of doctor. Folks, my time is up. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk to you later.